Jenny and the Ozark Mountains, written by Iris Culver Meadows, narrated by Laura Meadows. Log Cabin in the Ozark Woods. The Culver family went home as they had come to Kansas with their same few belongings strapped to the car. There was one noticeable difference. The spirit of adventure with which they had approached their new life in Kansas was gone, and in its stead was, if not a feeling of defeat, at least a desire to retreat to a more secure life. It was indeed fortunate that Dad had kept the farm just in case things didn't work out, for in truth, they hadn't. The younger children, thinking little about the broader issues, soon succumbed to the routine of travel across the treeless plains of Kansas by reviving their old amusements. They played games, sang, counted telephone poles, and found excitement in the trains that occasionally rattled along the tracks parallel to the highway. They waved and were thrilled when the engineer waved back. Leela was no longer with them, for she had married Robert and remained on the farm where she had once been a maid. She had been an asset to Dad by helping with the younger children, yet her marriage meant that he had fewer children to worry about. Three of the oldest children had flown from the nest. Now Dad had only five younger ones in his care. A national economic calamity, the crash of 29, had recently occurred and was to trigger a deep depression, which gripped the entire country for more than a decade. It was fortunate for any family to be able to head back to a farm where they could be assured of a living, however stark. It was easy to rent a house. The rural Ozarks had many abandoned ones, with a flue for a wood stove, a well or freshwater spring, and an outhouse. Perennial flowers such as peonies, bleeding hearts, irises, lilacs, hydrangea, and snowball bushes grew and bloomed in large shaded yards. It was also considered necessary to have trees near the house for a cooling shade on the hot summer days. The Culver family found a much better than average farmhouse in which to live. It was a pretty white with green trim frame house that stood halfway up a green sloped hillside. At the bottom of the hill near the road was a cider press, occasionally in use, and at the side of the large yard was one of the more frequently traveled dirt roads along which route mail was delivered. It was spring, and the children enjoyed many pleasant hours of rolling down the hill, sleeping under one of the numerous trees, and playing with animals that fast began to appear on the farm. Their house had a front porch that ended with a room at one side. Dad bought boxes of baby chicks and placed them in this room to be cared for by the children. Jenny loved to feed and water them and to pick up any tiny buds to stroke their soft yellow fur, eventually setting them down again to watch them waddle over the paper on the floor. Their fur gradually disappeared to be replaced by feathers, and later completely feathered, grown chickens emerged. When the night became warm, the chickens were turned out of doors to shift for themselves. Jenny carefully watched their habits, believing that the finest hens were the ones that had laid the greatest number of eggs in a day. Clarence, who liked to correct misconceptions, exploded this theory by explaining that At best, a hen lays only one egg a day. One day, a couple of salesmen came to the farmhouse when Jenny and Cricket were there alone and asked for just two hens as payment for a Kansas City newspaper, feeling that they were paying for a debt, which they had already owed. The girls chased and caught the chickens and handed them over, squawking and flapping their wings. Eventually, the children did receive their newspaper, but it was one of no interest to them, being written only for adults. The girls learned not to be so gullible, and they soon adopted the custom of farmers who seldom bought from city slickers. Later one afternoon, Newt burst into the house yelling, I don't believe it. I don't believe what you don't believe what Cricket asked, stopping her quarrel with Jenny over who would wash the dishes and who would dry. Miles says the dirt spot in the floor right there is blood. Newt said, pointing at the offending spot. He says this is a haunted house, 
and that a man was murdered right there, and that's his blood. And he says the man's ghost still lives here. I told him I don't believe it, that he's just superstitious. Let's ask Clip when he gets home, but maybe he'll just laugh at us, suggested Jenny, always worried about what someone would think. Just after sundown, Clip walked into the living room, but the three youngest children decided to stay in the kitchen because he had brought home a girlfriend. They heard the cheerful voice of Estelle saying, Now, I don't want to walk home alone if it gets dark. I'll walk home with you, Clip promised. Is that the blood of that murdered man, Estelle asked? I suppose it is, Clip answered, drawing up a couple of straight-back chairs for them to sit on. Dark shadows crept up the windows, and the darkness of night approached as Newt, Cricket, and Jenny hatched up a scary plot for the visitors. With suppressed glee and almost inaudible giggles, they draped a white sheet over Newt. Ooh, ooh. He wailed in shaky grief as he crept slowly into the living room. It is uncertain if Estel even heard the second woo, for at the first sight of that white thing, she bolted for the door. Clip never caught her as she ran from the house. He kept yelling that it was just Newt, but he turned and left. When he saw her father, he knew he had been had to explain things with Estel in such an excited state. Clip did eventually regain Estel's confidence. Later, when she was 13, they were married. And Clip and the beautiful red-haired Estel spent most of their lives on a farm a few miles away from the haunted house. There were undeniable unwanted inhabitants in the haunted house. They were fleas. They were everywhere, and driving a dog through the house would not clear them out. It was hoped they would all hop on the dog and ride outside, but such a hoped-for solution did not work. Hundreds of fleas remained in the house. Nid would sit on the floor with his back to the wall. Suddenly, his hand would shoot down his back inside his shirt, or in the front, or up a sleeve, then emerging pinching a flea to death. He had so much patience that he killed them in his sleep. Dad stood watching him with mixed amusement and seriousness. He said, we've got to get rid of them fleas before we go to our own house. You got a house? You found a house, Cricket exclaimed. Well, yes, but it'll be a while. I gave Frank Payton $10 for that log shack he's got in his place. Reckon we can take it apart and move it over yonder. We can put it on Newt's 20, where an old house used to be, and maybe we can get that old well to work in. When you gonna start on it, Clip asked. Right away. It seemed an eternity to the girls, as they watched Dad and the boys go away each morning to work on the house. After a couple of weeks, Dad told them the house was ready for them to move into. Dad drove the wagon and team of mules to the front of the house, where it was loaded with their spare collection of furniture and freshly scrubbed up clothes. The children climbed into the wagon bed along with four hound dogs that had the strong smell of flea powder about them. It was a long rocky journey between country roads. Never go directly to any place. It's not far as the crow flies, Dad had told them, but the wagon seemed to circle around endlessly. There was no longer a car, for Dad had practically given it away to end the constant fixing it required. Although they turned sharply from the road and headed off into the woods to follow a two-wheel path of grass and weeds from which the brush and tall trees had been cleared. After a quarter of a mile through the dense forest, the path suddenly ended just south of their new home. A few yards to the right, nestled under the great walnut tree, stood a little log cabin. Its backyard sloped gently down to a green meadow. With the expectation of this small meadow, a little clearing to the west, the cabin was completely engulfed in woods. It was as if nothing else existed in the world except woods and sky. There was no other house or evidence of a house to be seen. No sound except forest sounds could be heard. After a moment of absorption at the side of their log cabin, the children jumped down from the wagon bed and and began unloading furniture. The dogs howled and ran off into the woods. When the furniture was in place, the one-room log cabin became a living room bedroom. It contained two double beds, 
a rocker trunk, wood stove, and an old piano out of tune, and missing some ivory, but lovely by the children. Dad's old cornet from his band member days at church hung unused on a nail surrounded by clothing also hung on the wall. A lean-to made of boards nailed to the outside logs on the west became the kitchen and was furnished with a cook stove, homemade table, chairs, stool, and the safe, which Uncle Vernon has saved for them when they went to Kansas. A safe was a tall wooden cabinet used for storing food, cooking utensils, and dishes. Although glassware for table use had long since been replaced by tin cups and plates because the children broke the glass. What could be broken was broken. The house had floorboards throughout, large rough planks called panchions that had open spaces between them, through which Jenny tearfully discovered small items often fell to be forever claimed by the ground underneath. The proud family began home improvements on their farm. They they built shelter for the animals in the clearing west of the cabin. Houses made of boards, small trees, strips of tin, chicken wire, in fact anything that could be used for construction material. The roofs were of tin, a common sight in those days but blistering hot in the summer. Dad and the boys scooped out a pond north of the cabin to catch and hold rainwater for the animals. Then they began working on the well. Before any progress could be made, they had to take hose shovel, dogs, guns, anything available, and kill the dozens of snakes that couched menacingly in the cracks between the rocks that lined the well from top to bottom. At last, Dad ventured down the muddy bottom of the well, suspended at the end of a rope, which was held by the boys who watched from the security of the top rim. Now, send down the shovel, Dad called in a hollow voice from the bottom of the well, but the shovel came loose and fell, hitting Dad on the arm and causing a wound, which stopped any further work for many days. When they resumed work, they revised the procedure and sent the shovel down ahead of Dad. Unfortunately, the project was finally abandoned as useless, and the children continued to carry water from the fresh water spring in the woods at the bottom of the hill in front of the cabin. The children did not consider it strange at the time, but they owned the entire farm. When Dad made the purchase, each child was given a deed to a specific 20 acres with the stipulation that he could sell it only after he reached the age of 21. Newt owned the 21 where the house stood. Cricket owned the spring. Clip owned the field across from the school. Jenny owned the blackberry patch north of the cow pond, and the other children owned land in the wood. Dad did not own any land at all.